Well, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you very much for coming out this evening um, for what is one of my favorite events in the UGA calendar, um, the UGA versus Oxford Union debate. Um, I'm sure that both teams appreciate having such a good um, audience, um, healthy audience, and we hope that the evening will be one of fun and wit and entertainment. Um, I'm going to say a couple of things very briefly uh, to introduce the event, as it were, and then cede the floor to um, more appropriate speakers, people from whom you would actually like to hear a few things. Um, the UGA at Oxford program has organized this debate on three previous occasions. This is the fourth occasion. It was a tradition that was started by my predecessor in the post of director of the program, Dr. Judy Shaw, who is here with us today. And this is one of the many, many good things that she did at the University of Georgia during her tenure as the director of the Oxford program and then the associate provost for international education. The thing that I think is unique about this event, certainly from my perspective, uh, is the fact that as a study abroad program, we are extremely well known in Oxford. Um, we send over 200 students a year there. We have classes that are taught by up to 60 different faculty at the University of Oxford. Um, but it's by its very virtue, by its nature of being a study abroad program, um, we don't do a lot of events here on campus. And this is an opportunity for us to make a visible impact here on campus, for us to showcase um, what we do extremely well, which is forge and maintain this relationship, a very good relationship, an intellectual relationship, and a cultural relationship, an academic partnership with the oldest English-speaking university in the world. And so it's a, it's a great joy for me to bring to the forefront on this campus uh, an example of the best kind of interchange that happens, and to do it on the UGA campus as opposed to all our activities happening in Oxford. Um, and so I'm very, very thrilled to bring this, campus, to this event to North Campus, and I'm very happy um, to see so many of you here. Um, I would like to thank our illustrious panel of judges for being here with us this evening um, and, um, and taking time out to support this activity of the UGA at Oxford program, and in particular, President Adams and Provost Moorhead for making an, a long day even longer by agreeing to be on the panel after a, a day of meetings in Atlanta. Um, this is truly an event that brings, I think, campus and community together. The back of your program lists many of the people and groups, both on campus and in the town of Athens and in the state of Georgia, who have contributed uh, to this evening, uh, without whom this event would definitely not be possible. And I would like to, to thank in particular then and acknowledge our academic partners here on campus, the Terry, Franklin, Spear, and Grady Colleges, who not only um, work with us on our various study abroad programs, but have also provided support for this event. Um, and I'm just going to go very quickly through the list and, and highlight some of, the, some of the key individuals here. Dr. Ed Panetta, who is the director of the Georgia Debate Union, who has uh, served as a faculty advisor to the UGA team for this event, um, and indeed in all its previous iterations. Uh, the deans of the various colleges as they are listed there, uh, Dean Clark of the Grady College, Dean Loth of, the, uh, of Spear, Dean Stokes of Franklin College, and Dean Sumacrest of the Terry College. I would like to thank the Franklin Residential College, Dean Toma and Lisa Weimer for hosting the uh, Oxford debaters. In fact, when I um, started a dialogue with this year's uh, debate team about organizing this event. One of the first things that Stuart Cullen, who returns to us from the 2008 debate, said that they wanted to stay in, Franklin, in the Franklin Residential College. So that was the, the first piece that fell into place. Um, I would also like to thank the UGA Office of Public Affairs for helping us manage the publicity on this. Uh, Ted White and Claire Foggin from the UGA Athletic Association, who also received uh, the Oxford team and gave them a, a very good tour of our facilities. And uh, Deborah Lovelady from the Terry College, who is responsible for uh, spearheading this lovely stage decoration today. And Ron Blacksley from the College of Education, who will be videotaping this event. Our, um, 
Athens sponsors, the Last Resort Grill, Brig City Bread, Royal Peasant, Dolce Vita, who all provided various degrees of support and hospitality for our partners. And finally, the Hennessy Automobile Company, who has, been, who has come in as a major corporate sponsor of this event. So without all these various pieces falling into place, we could not make this event as successful as I think it will be. I would like to now give the floor to Dr. Kavita Pandit, the Associate, uh, the associate Provost for International Education, uh, who will say a few remarks, and, uh, and I wish us all a, a fun-filled evening. Thank you, Kelpin. Uh, let me add uh, to your welcome. Uh, welcome, everyone, to this uh, important event. Uh, before I take a minute of your time, uh, I wanted to, an event of this sort would not be possible without the organizational uh, support and efforts. And I want to take a minute to thank the UG at Oxford team. Uh, I'll call out the names and if you could uh, stand up if, as I call your name and if you could hold the applause till the end, I, I really want to make sure that this team is recognized. Kalpin, of course, uh, Jamie McClung, Angela File, Maggie Perry, Francis Molinier, Jennifer Sonnenberg, and of course, Linda DePascali from OIE. Could you please give them a hand for putting up this event? Thank you. I had the pleasure last night of uh, meeting and dining with our debaters. Uh, and uh, had a bit of a preview of, of the what's to come. Of course, the conversation was very far-ranging, uh, dynamic, even though th there was a tremendous jet lag. Our uh, Oxford colleagues were very energetic. It seemed to me that they discussed just about everything under the sun except anything to say about China's economic or political power. <laughs> I didn't hear that come up in the debate. They were very guarded about their arguments. Uh, they even discussed what they were going to wear and exchanged notes on what the clothes, clothes was, the protocol was, but nothing about China. So I am, like you, in great anticipation of how the discussions will go. Uh, I do, though, just want to take a minute to underscore how the importance and the richness of the UGA uh, Oxford program to those of you who uh, may not be aware about it. And rather than my own uh, words, I was browsing today uh, on the UG at Oxford website and found a number of student testimonials. And I'd like to share just a few of these. One student said, Oxford made me love to learn. For once, I wasn't just cramming for the test. I was really formulating coherent, intelligent opinions that I could defend against the dons and loving it. We became locals in town, studying in the libraries, dining at formal dinners, punting on the Thames, and even watching the eights, the annual crew races amongst colleges. Above all, the best memories will always be the bonds and fellowship we had living in the same house. Oxford showed me that I could be on my own, away from everything and everyone I had ever known, and succeed and learn lessons upon lessons about myself and the world. I think these comments say, say it all about the program, and we are delighted to bring here a little sampling of the kind of learning and engagement that goes on there. UGA's position as a leader in international education, of course, would not have been possible without uh, vision and energy from the very top. And we are most grateful to President Adams for his vision for UGA's international programs, study abroad, and the UGA Oxford partnership. And therefore, I welcome him to the podium. Thank you, Dr. Pandit and Dr. Trivedi, and certainly on behalf of the university, let me welcome each one of you here this evening. Uh, I've said on many occasions that I felt like the best thing I did during my own undergraduate time was to participate in intercollegiate debate. And I will add to it, I think one of the best things I've been involved in during my time at the University of Georgia has been to help create the residential program uh, at Oxford. Lord knows the people at Oxford need academic help from the University of Georgia. Uh, so we are, uh, we are 
very happy to continue that important uh, tradition this evening. Uh, you will, uh, by the time the evening is over, uh, you will recognize that we have here uh, today a very distinguished panel, which I would like to introduce to you, who will be our judges. I will begin, first of all, on uh, my right and your, well, your left with the Honorable Weish Fowler, uh, former U.S. Congressman, a U.S. Senator, and United States Ambassador, uh, one of this state's uh, most distinguished uh, citizens, and we're always honored when he can come and uh, share his uh, wit and wisdom uh, with us. Uh, next to him is the Honorable Annabelle uh, Mullins, who is uh, <clears throat> Her Majesty's Consul General uh, in Atlanta, uh, one of the most uh, active uh, Consul Generals among uh, the uh, international ambassadorial and uh, consul general delegation in the city of Atlanta, uh, very helpful to the university on a number of items that relate to relationships between this university <coughs> and her, uh, her native country. Next to her, of course, uh, someone who needs no introduction at the University of Georgia, uh, Jerry Moorhead, uh, the senior academic officer of the university, distinguished professor of business law, and uh, my great colleague in this endeavor. Uh, next to Jerry is uh, the Honorable Senator Cecil Staten, uh, representing uh, Georgia's uh, 18th uh, district. When Senator Staten and I uh, left the Capitol this afternoon about the same time, uh, the Senate had several votes uh, yet scheduled. Uh, I gave him a dispensation uh, in order to be here uh, this evening, and if any of you live in the Macon area district of Senator uh, Staten, uh, I hope you will remember him and the great help he has been to the University of Georgia on so many occasions, including uh, having a son here at the university now. On uh, my left and uh, your right, uh, Ms. Colleen uh, McEdwards, uh, Ms. McEdwards is the international news anchor for CNN, very distinguished uh, journalist in her own right, a native of Canada, and we're glad to have her with us this evening. Uh, next to her is uh, Dr. Ian Archer. Professor Archer is the subwarden of Keeble College, uh, one of the colleges, and in fact, frankly, the college with uh, whom among uh, the Oxford University colleges with whom we have had the closest uh, relationship. Uh, Professor Archer has taught uh, many of our students through the years and has been a former proctor uh, of Oxford University. And last and certainly uh, not least, uh, Dr. Stephen Wrigley, the Vice President for Governmental Affairs at the University of Georgia, a Northwestern PhD and the former uh, Chief of Staff for uh, former uh, Georgia Governor uh, Zell Miller. So uh, regardless of uh, whether you agree or disagree with the uh, rendering decision of the panel this evening, it's a very distinguished panel. And would you please join me in welcoming these judges? Thank you. This is the type of extracurricular activity that I think builds the kind of dynamic uh, intellectual climate that we wanted an institution uh, like this. And uh, we are especially honored to have our guest from the Oxford Debate Union uh, with us here this evening, as well as the very, very successful uh, University of Georgia debate team. And they are the main attraction. And so you have, uh, you have heard enough from us. I would simply tell you that in this state, debate began right outside this building. Approximately 200 years ago, in literally verbal debates between the members of the Phi Kappa Debating Society, which houses our debate program uh, to this day, and the Demosthenian uh, Literary Society, the building immediately to uh, my left and to, uh, to your right. That strong tradition of intellectual debate continues at this institution uh, to this day, and we are uh, pleased to have that tradition carried forward. Looking forward, we have also with us tonight a number of uh, fifth and sixth grade students from the KIPP, a Knowledge is Power program. 
KIPP is the largest uh, nationwide network of open enrollment public charter schools uh, in the United States. Uh, located on the west side of Atlanta, they have a thriving debate program in which these young fifth and sixth graders participate. And I simply would say that I hope that all of them take a hard look at the University of Georgia. And one of them is uh, sitting here on this stage a few years from now uh, representing uh, this institution in a debate uh, like this. This should be an educational evening uh, for all of us. We will be led through this by one of our most distinguished uh, uh, law professors, uh, Professor Peter uh, Appel. And uh, with that, uh, I will say thank you and turn the proceedings over to Professor Appel. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Adams, and good evening, everyone. The subject for tonight's debate is, be it resolved, China's economic and military rise threatens the interests of the United States and Great Britain in the 21st century. At a time when the United States economy and the economy in the UK are more parlous than we are like and historically used to, it's very tempting to turn our eyes overseas and look for possible and perhaps real threats from other growing nations. And China's uh, rise has been something that is worth discussing. You have some facts and figures in your program that the debaters will be referring to towards the end, which will help in this discussion. But I can think of no better group to lead us in this discussion than representatives of two of uh, uh, the uh, uh, countries, respective countries' institutions. Obviously, the University of Oxford has been an international leader in many types of research through the years, and the University of Georgia, albeit a more recent player on the stage when you're fighting with an institution that was established in the 11th century, it's a little bit difficult to compete. Um, has also taken uh, uh, its place in the forefront of having these kinds of discussion, be it through research, teaching, or service. Tonight, our debaters are going to participate in a modified form of debate that combines elements of the type of debating styles that are used in American institution and in British institutions. Our debate tonight will feature a total of eight eight-minute speeches, four from each side. And the team arguing in favor of the resolution, the University of Georgia, will speak first. The speakers, before they begin, will have to be recognized by me. I will have a gavel. And they will need to end their speeches when I indicate by tapping with the gavel. The time will be kept by a timekeeper in the audience. Make sure all the debaters know where our timekeeper is and that you can see um, the uh, uh, time signals. Um, and uh, uh, as I said, uh, at the end of, of their time, the speakers are, as are asked to conclude. Those of you who have engaged in the higher mathematics of counting the number of judges will notice that there are eight of them. In the event of a tie, which is possible, um, I will be casting the deciding vote. So the debaters are advised to be nice to me. <laughs> In order to combine some of the elements of American debating uh, style and British debating style, the teams have agreed on the following uh, specific format. After the first speech for each team, there will be a three-minute cross-examination period following the American debating style. The speaker must respond to the questions posed by a representative from the other side. During that first speech, there will be no other interruptions. During the next speeches of each side, points of inquiry or privilege are going to be permitted by the opposition following the British style. We have agreed on a certain amount of time for each of the speeches during which the speakers can speak uninterrupted. In the second and third speeches from each side, 
Speakers may not be interrupted during their first minute and their last minute. During the final speech for each side, speakers may not being, be interrupted during their first minute or their final three minutes of speaking. Speakers are not required to respond to these inquiries, but the teams have agreed on an informal agreement that each speaker will respond to at least two of the questions posed. After the debate is concluded, the judges and I will retire to deliberate. The judges and the teams have been uh, given a memorandum that outlines the judging criteria about how effectively they advance their points, their use of rhetoric, etc. So after the final speech of the evening, we'll have a brief recess where the judges and I will go down the stairs and out the side door. And please don't go far because you'll want to see how things turn out. Um, so we will retire uh, backstage and we will decide who the victor is. And either I or one of the judges will announce who the victor is along with some commentary. The judges will be allowed to um, uh, comment on the uh, uh, performances of the individual speakers if they wish. And so, there's been enough delay. I'm going to move back to my chair as moderator. And so, I call this house to order for a debate on the resolution, be it resolved, China's economic and military rise threatens the interests of the United States and Great Britain in the 21st century. I'd now like to recognize the first speaker in favor of the resolution from the University of Georgia, Georgia, excuse me, Mr. John Turner, for a speech not to exceed eight minutes. First, some thank yous are in order. The Oxford program uh, at UGA, and in particular, Dr. McClung, the associate director, he performed yeoman service in organizing and publicizing tonight's event. Dr. Panetta, the director of UGA debate, whose assistance and preparation was invaluable and, as always, wise. The Franklin, Grady, and Terry Colleges, along with the School of Public and International Affairs, our esteemed judges. It is certainly an honor to debate in front of such a prestigious group. And finally, the Oxford Union debate team, for making the long journey across the pond to the former colonies. <laughs> Our topic area is one that should be of grave concern for all of us. As young citizens of the United States and Great Britain, we have enjoyed a Western-led international order characterized by our shared interest in peace, respect for basic human rights, the spread of free and fair markets, and environmental protection. Like the generations before us, we now face a rising power that poses a fundamental threat to this order. We must stand resolved that China's economic and military rise threatens the interests of the United States and Great Britain in the 21st century. First, China's military rise threatens global peace. China, a consistent conflict between the US, UK, and China over the future of the international system demonstrates that their rise comes at the expense of our shared interest in peace and stability. With its rising military power, China cultivates alliances with adversaries of the US and the UK across the globe. It is only as a result of Chinese support that Kim Jong-il's North Korean regime is capable of developing nuclear weapons and flouting international pressure. A regime that the rest of the world acknowledges as a fundamental threat, China supports militarily and economically as a convenient foil. China's unyielding support for an aggressive dictatorship willing to sink South Korean ships on a whim makes the possibility of nuclear conflict in East Asia all too real. Even if another Korean War is averted, China's support decreases the credibility of U.S. security guarantees to its allies in Japan and South Korea. Both states might choose to develop nuclear arsenals of their own if China's rise disturbs the balance of power. For geopolitical and economic support, China continues to export advanced missile technology to Pakistan and Iran, opposing British and American efforts to enforce the international missile technology control regime. As the Nuclear Threat Initiative reports, Chinese missile transfers could lead to instability in South Asia as India and Pakistan continue to engage in a regional arms race, heightening the risk of military confrontation. Chinese missile exports and assistance to Iran provide the material base 
for Iranian deployment of missiles that could be used to, in the delivery of weapons of mass destruction. Iran's growing military capability could raise regional tensions in the Persian Gulf and directly threaten U.S. interests in the region, especially the safe passage of oil tankers. The liberal international order has always meant more than merely a reduction in conflict. Ever since Nuremberg, the U.K. and the U.S. have stood together for the importance of basic human rights. Both at home and abroad, the Chinese government encourages practices that violate basic human dignity. Pursuit of economic growth above all else oppresses minority groups such as Tibetans, Uyghurs, Mongols, and Chinese Christians. A mere rustle of the winds of change of the Jasmine revolutions of the past two months triggered a crackdown on foreign journalists and greater restrictions on internet usage in China. As we speak, China's first ever Nobel Prize recipient, Liu Xiaobo, is imprisoned as a result of his willingness to advocate for the basic human rights of his fellow Chinese citizens. Liu observed that China's practices extend beyond its borders. Quote, the regime has replaced the former Soviet Union to become a blood transfusion machine for other dictatorships. Particularly in the case of the support, uh, their support for Sudan, China's economic rise comes at the price of grave crimes against humanity. Nicholas Kristof, a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, writes regarding Sudan, China is now underwriting its second genocide in three decades. The first was Pol Pot's Cambodia, and the second is in Darfur. Chinese oil purchases have financed Sudan's pillage of Darfur. Chinese-made AK-47s have been the main weapons used to slaughter several hundred thousand people. The women and children I've seen it torn apart by bullets in Darfur and Chad, that lead and steel was molded in Chinese factories. Now, China's support for Gaddafi's regime in Libya may set the stage for yet another tragedy. This pattern of behavior demonstrates that the threat to our interests in human rights and an economic model built on respect for those rights brings us to our next area, that China's economic rise will hurt global prosperity. The possibility of a Beijing consensus that supports authoritarian state-sponsored capitalism will remove the economic incentives and tools available for directing economic growth that respects basic human rights. The mantra of global economic interdependence turns a blind eye to China's currency cheating. China Incorporated manipulates the global economy so that it enjoys economic growth at the expense of the US and the UK. China's refusal to let markets set the true value of its currency makes Chinese exports unfairly competitive with manufacturers in the US and the UK. Former US Assistant Treasury Secretary Fred Bergsten believes that removing China's currency edge would create 500,000 new jobs in the United States. China's blatant disregard for international norms of intellectual property steals the main engine of economic growth in the US and the UK, innovation. In 2009, 79% of all computer software installed in China was pirated. When American and British firms seek to invest in China, they are forced to transfer technology to Chinese firms that will soon become their competitors. China's accumulation of vast amounts of US and UK debt gives it enormous leverage on the international scene. At any point, Chinese leaders could threaten the value of both the dollar and the pound. Such a move would spark an unprecedented inflationary spiral, wiping out the savings and income levels in both countries. China's control over 97% uh, of the world's supply of rare earth metals and their recent decision to cut back experts, exports in these metals to increase their leverage in maritime disputes with Japan proves their willingness to turn economic success into a geopolitical threat. Lastly. China's economic rise threatens our planet. China's rise is driven by the burning of fossil fuels. Each percentage point added to Chinese GDP over the next 50 years marks a substantial contribution to greenhouse gas emissions and potentially catastrophic climate change. The UK has been a leading proponent of international environmental agreements, and China's rising emissions and opposition to international agreements constitutes a direct threat to those interests. In 2006, China overtook the United States as the world's leading greenhouse gas emitter. Emissions continue to grow. According to the US Energy Information Administration, in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, slumping Western economies will be no match for growth in China. China's carbon emissions increased 23% from 2007 through 2009. US emissions declined nearly 10. Solving climate change unilaterally without Chinese cooperation is impossible. The UK is a leading proponent of the European Union's plan to cut emissions 20 to 30 percent. According to Fatih Birol, chief economist of the International Energy Agency, such cuts would roughly equal China's two-week 
greenhouse gas output. What to do about these threats to our shared interests is a question that will require our sustained intellectual energy. But we can say for sure that the difficult choices about our priorities and possible responses to China's rise will be aided by our clear recognition that China's economic rise does present genuine threats. Thank you. The chair would now like to recognize Mr. Stuart Cullen from the Oxford Union for a period of cross-examination not to exceed three minutes. And, yeah, I guess I'll just stay sitting here. And <laughs> I, what I want to do is just follow your structure um, and just ask you like one or two uh, points about each thing. So you started off by talking about um, China as a, a global political threat as a result of its military rise. So what I want to do is just pick on one example, which is to do with North Korea. Um, which was something you focused on relatively heavily. Um, would uh, UGA accept that the possibility of a humanitarian crisis being created were the uh, regime in North Korea to just ultimately collapse, sending large numbers of refugees into China, which they would then have to deal with, is a concern for them that, and is something that makes them inform their policy. And the other countries have exactly the same kind of national interests at stake in other issues. The fact that North Korea borders China is just something that they have to deal with. We shouldn't expect immediate action from them. Uh, even if we should not expect action exactly in line with the US and the UK, the question is one of leverage and support. The US and the UK push North Korea on its nuclear program, whereas China supports it. Even if China has some interest in stability and you know, no humanitarian disaster in North Korea, those are interests that we share as well. But the point on which we differ is the development of their nuclear weapons and their other military programs. OK, sure. All right. Um, we'll talk about that later. Um, on, on, on the point of economics, you mentioned that China has an enormous control of US debt and that that control is increasing and that they're going to be willing in the future to use that against us in a kind of belligerent way. Well, isn't it the case that China actually owns only 8% of US debt, which is the same amount that um, Britain and Japan own? Um, and secondly, that they have no interest whatsoever in the collapse of Western economies, given if that does happen, they lose their main trading partners. So why is it that you think that they're going to suddenly cut the, you know, pull the rug from underneath the global economic system? Why is that going to be in their interests? It's a threat that can be exercised at any time. It's a degree of leverage that we should not be willing to accept. On the question of the amount of sovereign debt that's being held, China is the largest holder of US debt. And so the, their relative position is not only strong now, but is growing increasingly strong. Okay, sure. I, I just want to point out really quickly that it's actually not the largest holder of US sovereign debt. The US is the largest holder of US sovereign debt. So <laughs> excuse me, excuse, excuse me, excuse me. Other sovereign, right. rather. Obviously, US people okay. have purchased US bonds. Sure. Um, OK, the, la the last thing I want to say is to do with the environment, um, which was your final point. Um, and all I want to say is that, you know, quite clearly, China is a country that has a massive incentive in creating, I I'm going to be really quick on this, but like basically we just think that um, engagement with China is much more effective than being belligerent and blaming them for the problem of uh, 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 global warming. Wouldn't you say that a better way to engage them is to try and get them on board rather than to make them en our enemy? As we pointed out in the summary of our speech, the question of getting China on board depends on identifying the real threats that they do pose to our interests. We haven't proposed that we need to be belligerent in all cases with China, merely that we need to understand that their economic rise threatens us. Thank you. The chair would now like to recognize Ms. Laura Winwood from the Oxford Union for a speech not to exceed eight minutes. Mr. Speaker, judges, ladies and gentlemen, a very, very good evening to you all. Before I open the case for the opposition, I really would like to take a moment on behalf of our team from Oxford to say what a huge pleasure and privilege it is for us to be here today. This is a particularly special visit for me, as this is my very first visit to the United States. In fact, when I heard I would be coming to Georgia, I was so excited to be crossing over the pond, as you say, that I jumped up, spilt my English breakfast tea, and had to clean it up with my very own Princess Diana commemorative tea towel. <laughs> so, I'll also confess my uh, confusion over the customs form which we were asked to fill out prior to landing here, particularly at being asked if I was transporting insects. Is this a recurring problem? I don't know. Um, I was also um, very amused to be emailed by one of your reporters from your student paper who asked if I would mind answering a few questions. 
Certainly, I thought, expecting to be asked my views perhaps on China. But no, I was instead asked if I had ever met none other than Her Majesty the Queen. <laughs> now, of course, I responded that I do indeed take tea with Her Majesty every Thursday at four. Of course, you will know that the Prime Minister sees her at three. <laughs> but, joking aside, we really do want to say a huge thank you for your wonderful hospitality, um, a brief but incredibly exciting trip. So thank you so much. And so now, on to, uh, on to the, tonight's resolution. And before I move on to my first points and set out our case on this side of the debate, that is, of course, the side of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, see what I did there, um, <laughs> we need to first consider exactly what it is that we conceive of as a threat in the 21st century. And we think we can answer thus, that a threat in the context of this debate is any change in the political or economic balance in the world. Since a change from the status quo means that there is always the possibility that change can bring with it consequences or implications that are indeed damaging. But what we do not believe is that all changes should necessarily be considered as a threat. The point of this debate, as we see it, is to draw out some of the implications of China's military and economic rises. And we, on this side, think that there are plenty of reasons why people in the US and UK should not feel threatened by the rise of China. Our general view of the case, therefore, we need to define what we believe the interests of the US and UK to be. Following me, Stuart will define the diplomatic implications of China's rise, as well as the extent to which we should really fear China's military capacities. Andrew will then continue the case by addressing the economic concerns that I'm sure the other side will try to convince you, ladies and gentlemen, are the most terrifying the world has ever seen. We, of course, being Brits, would uh, actually con uh, contend that the world has already encountered the most terrifying thing in none other than Lady Gaga's meat outfit that recently <laughs> shot the world. But now, to be serious and to set the scene for the arguments that will follow mine, the most important fact we really need to establish is the sort of China that we're dealing with today. And we put it to you that the authoritarian, corrupt China that the other side will no doubt try to sell to you is rather two-dimensional and more to the point, a gross oversimplification of the China of the 21st century. The first aspect of our case I put you now is who and what makes up the China of today, their leaders, the changing face of their politics, changes to social mobility, and why all of these factors should cause us to be more hopeful than the other side would have you believe. And I'm going to try and do all of this in about four minutes. So, China is more complicated than we would originally think for many reasons. It is governed by a centralised party which remains, on the surface, pro-communist. There are many factions within the party, although these do in fact, we would argue, act as a check on each other, which is a positive thing. But also the sheer scale of the country not only results in significant regional differences, but a further extension of power wielded by regional officials. And with these caveats in mind, however, we do not believe, as some radical proponents would have you believe, that China is heading straight for revolution. We believe it is more likely that we will see a gradual but continual progression towards liberalisation. And this is why. 20 years ago, even 10 years ago, China was a seat of endemic political corruption. Today, however, there are an increasing number of trials of former officials who exhibited corruption. And the point here really is that this is one step towards building up the trust of the Chinese people in their leadership, demonstrating that the opinions of the people are now being taken seriously, and also, quite possibly, that China is very aware that the world is watching. Furthermore, we need to only look at the rising middle classes who are increasingly politically aware and who, we would argue, have exerted pressure on their leaders to stem and eventually put an end to the corruption that was just so rife at the end of the last century. The quality of life, too, has dramatically improved within China. Home ownership is continuing to boom. There is a proliferation of American branded luxury goods, although I will look to Andrew to uh, explain this phenomenon within the economic context. And the vast numbers of Chinese university students and teachers who now travel to the UK, particularly to Oxford, in fact, to enrol in language and cultural study programs. This is, just not, this is not only indicative of an increase in the Chinese population seeking to educate themselves in the ways of the West, but that China seeks a degree of acculturation of Western values, since many of these programs are, after all, government-sponsored. And so, so to move on to my final point, I would like to finish on what I believe is a very hopeful note and that this is the potential new leadership of China. Reported in the Financial Times magazine just two days ago, uh, was an article depicting the favourites for President and Premier of, of China, Xi Jinping and Li Keqiang, both of whom have very strong ties with the United States and the United Kingdom. 
and who are thought to favour a progressive, gradual and steady liberalisation. Now, we admit that we cannot hope for immediate change, but what we do believe we will see through these new leaders is a slow, steady um, change, which surely is preferable to the radical change that could have the potential to destabilise and would be incredibly damaging. We should also take a very positive note from the recent comments from Chinese Premier Wen Jiabo, who was very um, public in calling for political reform. And so, sort of in a summary, therefore, in light of these changes to China's domestic colour, we believe, and we put it to you, ladies and gentlemen, that the China of tomorrow is not one to fear, but an international power with which we should engage and work with. After all, to admit fear is to admit that in some way we are helpless to a growing threat that is beyond our capabilities to resolve, and we do not believe that this is the case. Thank you very much. The chair would now like to recognize Mr. Bobby Rosenbleeth from the University of Georgia for a period for a cross-examination period not to exceed three minutes. Uh, thank you. So uh, let me start with your liberalization argument. Um, you're assuming that China will play by the international rules as their leadership changes. However, in our first speech, we cite the example of China selling advanced missile technology to Iran. And it's likely to believe that they're selling this technology to gain access to Iranian oil. As China's oil demand only will grow in the course of their economic rise, will they, um, w wouldn't they do more to support destabilizing regimes like Iran rather than um, stop supporting them? I think these are all incredibly valid points. And actually, um, my two uh, colleagues are going to go into this in far more detail. But I think the real point, actually, that we want to take from this, and that I did actually just make now, is that by pushing China away and by marking them out as the enemy, by being suspicious of them and by treating them as the other, we are actually encouraging them to become more belligerent and um, support such regimes. And well, so really the well, actual fact is that well, we need to be, be honest, working with we them. Have, we've identified that China is supporting their, uh, or China is, is supporting Iran precisely for economic reasons, not how we treat them. Our, our, our rhetoric towards China isn't threatening right now. However, they're continuing to pursue these out of fundamental interest. If we determine these fundamental interests are threatening to us, isn't that an example of, of, of how um, we should recognize and acknowledge this threat? We're certainly saying that there, um, we should indeed acknowledge this threat. To push it to one side would be foolish. But it is not, it's not just um, sufficient to say uh, they're threatening and therefore we should be you know, worried by them. It is to say they're a threat, let's deal with this, let's work with them, and let oh, us engage with them in I, an economic I, way. I agree we should have a discussion at some point about how to deal with it, but this debate is about whether or not they're a threat. So I'd like to explore uh, your definition about um, you know, what a threat is. You say a threat is anything that changes um, the global order or balance of, of, balance of things. Well. Foreign policy actors, like those in the Foreign Office, have to determine you know, what in international relations constitutes a threat and what isn't, so they can focus on the allocation of, of diplomatic resources. So in that world where anything could be a threat, any change at all, how should governments determine what constitutes a threat and what doesn't? That is an incredibly complicated question. I would love to spend more time answering it. Um, in terms of a threat, well, I actually think that we don't have much time here to talk about this. But as I said at the beginning, it really is something, um, any change from the status quo, so in, that, in this debate we're talking about so economics and politics, is something that could potentially be a threat because it is something that is unknown. Okay, so basically, as long as China is changing, then we face a threat from them. Is that your contention or definition of a threat? I think that is a, um, a definition. But well, I'm trying to get at yeah. your definition. Oh, we, so we, we said that out. You weren't paying attention there. <laughs> I know. Your definition is any change is a threat. Well, mm, okay. <laughs> I'd like to thank our speakers so far and remind the audience that for the next speeches, points of inquiry and privilege will be recognized during the next two speeches from either side. Points of privilege and, and inquiry will be allowed during, uh, or excuse me, after the first minute and before the last minute of each speech. 
In the last speech, they will be allowed after the first minute and before the last three minutes. Um, I would remind the audience that the points of privilege and inquiry are for the debaters to ask each other. Because of the acoustics in the room, we won't be inviting uh, uh, questions and comments from the audience during the speaker's time. And as you have done so far, and I thank you for this, we ask that you hold all of your applause until the end of each person's speech so that they can maximize their time and the points that they're trying to make. And so, I would like to now recognize the spec uh, second speaker in favor of the uh, resolution from the University of Georgia, Mr. Rob Mulholland, for a speech not to exceed eight minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests and judges, thank you very much for coming out tonight. While our esteemed opponents from Oxford have presented a number of reasons why China could potentially serve as a partner to the United States and Great Britain in the 21st century, one would be remiss not to acknowledge the multitude of factors that suggest China is on course to become our most serious adversary. The present facts and trajectories of Chinese actions and policies suggest a bleak outlook for shared U.S. and British interests in peace, prosperity, and preservation of the planet's natural resources and claims to the contrary are largely premised upon wishful thinking, optimistic speculation that China might someday reverse or dramatically alter its current policies. The gradual trend towards liberalization that the negative cites is in fact going in the opposite direction. While my colleague Elizabeth will go into greater detail regarding the negative consequences of China's rise for the economy and the environment, I intend to focus this speech on threats to international stability and human rights. I would like to propose that the negative's optimistic outlook towards China's rise reflects claims that were leveled in the early 1990s regarding Russia's potential integration into the liberal international order. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, scholars pronounced the end of history and envisioned the uninhibited growth of liberal democracy. However, Russia, as we know, has not developed into the liberal democracy that these scholars envisioned. Instead, they have maintained order through domestic crackdowns and aggression abroad. We've been caught off guard by Russian meddling in, U one moment, please, in Ukraine and Georgia, and we ought not repeat the error with respect to China. If we fail to attend the mechanisms by which China is likely to challenge US and British interests over the course of this young century, then we render ourselves naively unprepared for the conflicts that our relationship will likely encounter. It is a fact that China possesses growing leverage, and in numerous instances, its interests diverge from those of the United States and Great Britain. If we are going to be able to negotiate effectively and constructively engage China, it will only be possible on the basis of mutual understanding and recognition. We must not presume that China will invariably support our interests and cooperate. If we find ourselves caught off guard when our interests diverge, we will find ourselves likely to misjudge and miscalculate. As John has pointed out, China's economic rise has, <laughs> has not coincided with increased support for the contemporary international order. On the contrary, China has worked against shared U.S. and British interests in peace and stability through its willingness to support any spoiler, providing crucial resources. Hello. <laughs> okay, so in the cross-exam, John actually failed to answer why China would bother to do any of this, given that it would destroy the world economic order, which would clearly also destroy China. Well, uh, that's not entirely true. In the case of Sudan, China has attempted to secure natural resources or its own economy by supporting a nation that's conducting a genocide. And that's something that we take issue with and think constitutes a threat to shared U.S. and British interests in stability and human rights. Uh, On a point of information. Yes. Um, isn't it the case that America has been propping up the Gaddafi regime for a fairly long time and it did exactly the same thing in Egypt? So why, does, why is China any different? Well, uh, when the U.S. the U.S. does have some unsavory allies that are a legacy of the Cold War. Uh, <laughs> however, these unsavory allies largely represent the exception and not the rule. The U.S. has cultivated alliances with countries like Great Britain. Our contention is that China. <laughs> our contention is that China has never found an ally that it finds unsavory, and that that is a threat to U.S. and British interests. As North Korea sinks South Korean ships and threatens core U.S. allies with nuclear aggression, China does not merely stand idly by. They provide, one moment, please. They provide the missiles and diplomatic support that Kim Jong-il needs in order to make good on his threats 
allowing an unsteady dictator to potentially annihilate upwards of 10 million people in a matter of seconds. Even when it does not conduct aggression abroad, North Korea represses its own population, demeaning shared U.S. and British interests and ensuring basic human rights and dignities for all. This scenario continues to play out not merely within East Asia, but across the globe. Not contented to provide arms to one major adversary of the United States and Great Britain, China has also proactively supported Iran. One might wonder whether Iran will develop weapons of mass destruction, but we can be sure that they possess the missile technology needed to launch these weapons. They received it from China. Question. And we know that we cannot... Go ahead. Okay. Is, it, is it or is it not true that the U.S. helped install and, and uh, prop up the Pinochet regime in Chile, which led to the murdering of about 3,000 of its own citizens under a dictatorship and the disappearance of tens of thousands more? Again, we feel that unsavory alliances are largely a legacy of the Cold War that represent the exception and not the rule for the United States, and that China has not found an ally that it finds unsavory. We think the U.S. has made progress on issues of international human rights and promoting stability under the administration of Barack Obama. And even if all of this is true, we don't think that U.S. hypocrisy is a reason why the U.S. shouldn't perceive China as a threat to international stability and human rights. I'm going to move on. Finally, <laughs> China has provided advanced weaponry to Pakistan in contravention of the missile technology control regime. One need not go to great lengths to imagine the dangers that arise from Pakistan's ongoing nuclear arms race with India, and this destabilizing spiral is fueled by China. While the negative would have you believe that China's economic self-interest will encourage them to cooperate with contemporary powers, the historical record indicates that this scenario does not always play out as expected. The Economist claims, the belief that China is now too enmeshed in globalization to put the world economy in jeopardy through war or coercion is sanguine. Integration has sometimes gone before conflagration. Europe went up in flames in 1914, even though Germany was Britain's second largest export market and Britain was Germany's largest. Japan got rich and fell in with European powers before it brutally set out colonizing Asia. In the case of Sudan, China has provided military and economic support in exchange for almost exclusive access to natural resources, ultimately supporting a genocide to insulate its economic well-being from competition with other nations. This is not the form of economic integration that we might hope for, and it is not a growing trend towards liberalization that the negative would have you believe. Now, as Libya verges on civil war, China lends its support to the regime of Muammar Gaddafi, once again shielding a repressive regime and endangering shared U.S. and British interests and human rights protections in order to ensure that it never really needs to integrate in the liberal economic order. And as John pointed out, the domestic record is no better to say nothing of the Tibetans and the Uyghurs. It's worth recognizing that while our, in the United States, most recent Nobel Peace Prize winner is president in China, theirs resides in jail. Therefore, I would suggest that threats should not be defined merely as any change in the balance of international relations, but rather attempts to coerce, and that China is attempting to coerce the U.S. not to pursue its interests with respect to countries like Sudan, North Korea, Iran, and Pakistan, and that even if they're not likely to engage in a full-scale military confrontation with the United States preemptively, they are likely to support any spoiler to make sure that the United States and Great Britain cannot advance its interests across the globe. Thank you. Thank you. The chair now recognizes Mr. Stuart Cullen from the Oxford Union for a speech against the resolution not to exceed eight minutes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, it's an absolute pleasure to be back here in Athens. I spoke in the debate back in 2008 and was made to feel so welcome then by everyone that I absolutely jumped at the chance to come back again this time. I think the only criticism I've ever had about your country, at least uh, since I turned 21, is the way that whether you walk into a gas station, into the student centre, or into Taco Bell, as soon as people hear your accent, they immediately get incredibly excited and say some variant of, oh my gosh, are you from England? <laughs> but no, I reply, from Scotland. And it's very important, you know, you know but, it, but it's okay, because they immediately become even friendlier. After all, you know, both our nations have suffered at the hands of the English. <laughs> The only difference is that you guys were able to get rid of them, right? <laughs> so, 
I absolutely love America, ladies and gentlemen, and I envy your ability to break free from the shackles of tyrannical oppressors. But I'm very sorry to say that people have not in my country have not always felt this way about your country. During the American Civil War, many in Britain rejoiced at the prospect of the breakup of the United States. Fearful of America's economic and military rise, the British Prime Minister, much of the Cabinet, and many ordinary British people were very pleased by the prospect of the country's breakup and came very close to intervening on the side of the South. Yet today, the United States and Britain have an extremely close diplomatic relationship. We share extremely similar foreign policy goals. Britain has benefited from the rise of America as a superpower despite our initial fears to the contrary. Our two countries have learned from each other in difficult times. And yes, ladies and gentlemen, our two countries have formed what has been called a special relationship. On a, on a lighter note, Andrew is hoping to form some special relationships of his own while he's here. So, ladies, after the debate, watch out. Or indeed... Uh, <laughs> Or, or indeed form a queue. Um, I'm, you know, I'm not going to comment on which I think would be the more sensible option. Um, the serious point here is this. Any shift in the balance of global power is going to be cause for concern to those who under the status quo are in a powerful position. We do not intend to try to disprove this truism. We don't think the point of the debate is a technical analysis of whether, and this is the point that um, Bobby was trying to get out of Laura, we don't think the point of this debate is a technical analysis of whether something is a threat. Everything is a threat. If you get in a car, you're obviously going to be in some level of danger. We think the point of this debate is to try and draw out some of the points about whether we should be more hopeful or more fearful of China's economic and military rise. And we think that we should be more hopeful. So in order to prove that, what I'm going to do is look at China's general foreign policy and what the motivating factors are behind it. Second, I'll be looking at the specific examples of Taiwan and Tibet. And finally, I'll be looking at the long-term military balance of power between America and China. So ladies and gentlemen, what exactly is Chinese foreign policy? Well, it's unquestionably the case that China is becoming more assertive in Asia. It's growing its military, it's becoming more belligerent with its rivals over the South China Sea. The proposition have told us all of these things, and we pretty much accept them. Yet, ladies and gentlemen, the world is full of belligerent powers, and not all of them constitute nece necessarily particularly huge threats. Laura, for example, can be extremely assertive and really very intimidating. Does she constitute a threat to me? Well, probably, because I have very limited ability to control her actions. However, you know, she's just a bit mad. Um, the question really is, what can, what can we do in Britain and America what, to understand what is motivating China? Because if we can do that, then we can control and understand what they're doing, and then we can understand whether they're actually constituting a threat. So what are the factors behind Chinese um, what are the factors that motiv are motivating China? Well, first, the global economic crisis has clearly made her feel more powerful in comparison to America and other Western nations, which are now burdened by huge levels of national debt. And Andrew will be discussing whether, in reality, this is actually strengthening China's hand. Second, they have an enduring desire to protect what they see as their own sovereign rights, and particularly what they describe as their core territorial claims, Taiwan, the South China Sea, and Tibet. Third, there's a good deal of tension over China's forthcoming leadership changes in 2012. Chinese politicians are jockeying for position within the ruling Communist Party, and one, way to find it, and one sure way to find advancement is to assert China's strength and to decry American failings. And this is the fourth and the most important point, ladies and gentlemen. American foreign policy, uh, no thank you, and attitudes towards China and to the Far East, yeah, so American foreign policy and attitudes towards China and the Far East generally has been inconsistent, ill-judged, and incendiary. The increasing unpopularity of America and President Obama in China has incentivized Chinese politicians to respond in kind, with political rewards to be reaped from jingoistic attacks on America. President Obama came into office declaring himself to be the first Pacific president. And in a break with the Bush administration, he initially pursued a policy of conciliation with China. He refused to meet the Dalai Lama and had several lengthy private conversations with President Hu. All this meant that in the first months of his administration, a BBC poll found that Obama had a 66% approval rating in China. 71% of those polled in that same poll found that, it found that, more, that more people were, think, thought that America was a friend rather than a threat to Chinese interests. And this policy was beginning to bear fruit, ladies and gentlemen. The soft power language of Chinese diplomacy was becoming more prominent, with the emphasis on trade and cultural expansion rather than military domination. But the problem, ladies and gentlemen, is that at the same time as Chinese expectations were being raised by this, new by this newfound culture of goodwill, sadly, American politics doesn't allow you to play the waiting game that this approach needs. With elections every two years, and with the kind of difficulties Obama has faced in his domestic political agenda, just a moment, um, 
you need headline grabbing policy initiatives which portray the president as a strong leader. And with the economic crisis, China has become a useful scapegoat for American politicians of all persuasions. Go ahead. If China's political system is as complex with as many different factions as you suggest, why should we presume that a liberal, non-threatening faction will succeed in gaining power? That's an interesting point. The thing, what I, th what I think is important, though, is this: the way in which you're going to strengthen China's liberal factions against the ones who want to be belligerent against America is not to give those belligerent factions more power. How do you do that? You start railing against China. You start funding Taiwan, uh, Taiwan's military, which is precisely what the Obama administration has done. If you don't give the belligerent factions within the Chinese political system the ammunition with which to attack their more liberal allies, you're reducing the chances of them taking power. I think that's the point. Okay. Um, up, no, it's okay. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so the run-up to the midterms um, in November saw China being blamed for everything, from the increasing price of oil to the loss of manufacturing jobs across America. Now, Andrew will speak more about the reality of that political situation. But my point is demonstrated well, that the point I was just making, by Senator Chuck Schumer, who spoke of China's boot to the throat of America's economic recovery. This kind of language is incendiary and will necessarily trigger a defensive mentality on the part of the Chinese government. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the point. That's why they've been funding Iran. They, if they feel as though they are at odds with the Western world, which is precisely what the Obama administration and all other Western governments have been doing, using them as scapegoats for their own problems. That's when they feel they need to start allying with their, with their enemies, Iran being the most prominent of them. No thanks. Um, China bashing, ladies and gentlemen, is easy political meat for American politicians facing tough elections. A tapping in America is becoming more advantageous too for Chinese politicians seeking preferment within their own party. So let's stop giving them reasons to do so. What we need to realize, ladies and gentlemen, in Britain, America, and China, is that our politicians' most important political goal is our own domestic economic prosperity. We can do our part, ladies and gentlemen, in putting across that message tonight by rejecting this motion, by saying we're not scared of China. America has a proud history of meeting enormous challenges. Your people have proved time and again capable of raising their game. The rise of China... I'll be literally one second. The rise... <laughs> The rise of China is a challenge, but it's one that we can together meet and face down. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, I beg to oppose the motion. <clears throat> Thank you. The chair would now like to recognize Ms. Elizabeth Allen from the University of Georgia for a speech not to exceed eight minutes in favor of the resolution. Like my teammates before me, I would like to thank everyone who made this event possible. The Oxford team for flying over to participate in the event, our distinguished judges, and the audience for supporting the debate. China's rise threatens the shared interest of the United States and the United Kingdom. We from the UGA team are attempting to present a rational and pragmatic view of the reality of China's rise, and we believe we have pointed to specific examples that demonstrate a threat to our interests. Rob did a fantastic job of discussing the dangerous geopolitical implications of China's power and the menace that China poses to the basic values for which we stand. I will analyze the threat that China poses to the economy and to the environment. But first, I'm going to address their argument that China's rise is not a threat. Yes, everything can be a threat, but not everything is a threat to our interest. And we have identified specific examples of how they threaten our interest. Potential partners are also potential adversaries. We are not arguing that China's threat nece necessitates a military response or that China is an evil entity. Instead, we are rationally looking at the implications of China's rising economic and military strength and recognize that it will fundamentally alter the current balance of power. Hope is not a foreign policy. The U.S. does not have influence over China's foreign policy. And us pretending like everything is going to be okay and as if we do nothing, then China is going to peacefully rise isn't going to change their current political reality. The Chinese government right now is preventing any mention of the Jasmine Revolution in, within China's borders because they are worried about a political uprising. This is nothing that U.S. foreign policy can change. By identifying ways that China will threaten our interests, we help to develop responses that to constructively deal with these threats so that we can avoid nightmare scenarios. 
Global prosperity is based on the economic order established and enforced by Western powers. This order is conducive to mutually beneficial growth. China, however, has refused to accept the underlying philosophy that supports the post-war peace. By manipulating its currency, counterfeiting products, and wielding dangerous leverage over the U.S. and U.K., China's actions demonstrate the model of the Beijing consensus is incompatible with the hopes of shared economic prosperity. Yeah. If the Chinese revalue their currency sharply, about 900 million Chinese people are going to be pushed below the poverty line, about 300 million of which are going to end up migrating to the cities. Do you think that China maybe has an interest in not having a massive social disruption in its own country and that might explain why it's doing it? Yeah, so I think that proves our point that China's growth and having political stability depends on it doing something that trades off with growth in the United States and the United Kingdom. It proves that state-run capitalism is not compatible with our own growth. China's export-led growth strategy depends on China artificially manipulating its currency so that it can sell goods cheaply on the global market. Already, the strategy has irrevocably set growth back throughout the developed world. According to the Nobel Prize winning economist Paul Krugman, this policy in effect imposes an anti-stimulus on the economy, costing millions of jobs, pounds, and dollars. This present day loss has exponential implications for our future. The money we are now sending to China was the money that could have been invested in educating students or researching cutting edge in technology. Have you thought that the fact that China owns a lot of U.S. government bonds is what keeps interest rates in the U.S. low, which means people who want to start up businesses and possibly get out of the recession are able to do so because they have easy access to credit? Um, but China is also taking lots of money out of our economy. So yes, they are buying up lots of bonds, but this is so they can then take money back from us by selling us cheap products and taking away our factors of production by, t by encouraging companies to move to China, which is taking away innovation. Uh, this present, presents a bleak outlook for our nation's economies. Uh, another point that John mentioned in his speech is that China's violations of intellectual property rights is another example of how the Beijing consensus cares little for global norms meant to provide for the common good. The stealing and copying of patented ideas cost U.S. industries over $2 billion each year. These infringements effectively guarantee that Western companies must expect lower profit margins if uh, in the future. If they rotate, relocate to China, they risk their products being forged and their technology stolen. If they remain in their home country, China will produce cheaper products and they won't be able to compete. A good example of this is the 2005 GM case against the Chinese Cherry. It was a direct replica of one of GM's cars and even the doors could be interchanged. But when GM brought this case up to China, the China court ruled that GM didn't have a case because there wasn't a patent in China and this cost GM millions of dollars. By stealing technology, China takes away any incentive for innovation. According to the U.S. Trade Representative Susan Schwab, innovation is the lifeblood of a dynamic economy. So even if China is helping us get money in the short term, they're encouraging us to hurt ourselves in the long term, while also currently taking away growth. China is so large that it can get away with flouting global trade and intellectual property norms, and there's little we can do in retribution. Alternatively, China has many instruments of manipulation that it can use against us. As John said, in 2010, China placed an embargo on rare earth metals, which are crucial for the manufacturing of products as diverse as cell phones and defense technology. China mines 95% of the world's supply of these metals. China also holds massive reserves of U.S. debt, about $2 trillion. Even more ominously, China is buying reserves of copper so that if it needs to dump U.S. debt, it can do so without hurting itself. Never before has a foreign country held so much power over the U.S. economy. And China is unafraid to hold this threat over the United States or the United Kingdom to force our hand in any number of clashes. They argue that interdependence and Chinese growth is going to lead to this rosy picture while everyone is working together. But this argument is empirically false. Germany was Britain's largest trading partner before World War I. As China develop, it develops its internal market, it will depend less on the United States. China's growing copper reserves demonstrate that China is already taking this transition into calculation. And even if China does not want a full square war, China's current support for rogue states demonstrate that it does not pass up opportunities to be a support for any spoiler to our interest. As currency manipulation and China's violation of intellectual property rights illustrates, China's growth directly trades off with our own. It's naive to think that things will be any different in the future. A more realistic understanding um, is a, of history, it was quoted in The Economist earlier.
Power changes nations. It expands their wants and desires, increases their sense of entitlement. It makes them more ambition. It lessens their willingness to take no for an answer. For the U.S. and the United Kingdom, the power transition did not hurt because we have shared values. We care about global peace, not supporting regimes like Sudan, economic prosperity, global trade norms, human rights, and environmental protection. Mutually beneficial cooperation depends on these commonalities, but these do not compose the interests of state-run capitalism. And let us not forget the environmental consequences of the growth that China is so intent on pursuing. China is the number one world's largest emitter of greenhouse gases. And while per capita emissions in the U.S. and U.K. are shrinking, China's growth is set to continue. In fact, China's growth in one year adds the same amount of emissions as adding entire England to the planet. Nothing in China's history demonstrates any concern for the environment. Only 1% of China's urban residents breathe clean air. Today, we think of China's exports as cars and cheap clothing. Tomorrow, we will remember their exports as polluted skies, rising sea levels, and droughts that strike at the world's most vulnerable populations. State-run capitalism shows no concern for pursuing policies with the global interest in mind. Why should we think that China will change today and make sacrifices for the rest of the world? Thank you. The chair now recognizes Mr. Andrew Rhodes from the Oxford Union for a speech in opposition to the resolution not to exceed eight minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, a spectre is haunting the, the nations of Great Britain and the United States. This spectre is fear-mongering which takes a pl place amongst individuals, politicians and the media. We are told to be afraid of a rising power in the East, China. We, not as in the past, because they are communist, but because they are capitalist, too capitalist. I'm going to talk to you about three things. Firstly, I'm going to talk to you about the impact that China has on the US due to US debt. Secondly, the impact of China as a globalized nation on the US and the UK. And finally, I'm going to tell you why trade with China will open a door to a new liberal and potentially democratic Chinese state. Before I do so, I want to deal with some of the things that came out of the last speech. Right, firstly, we the, the prop is basically circular, as Stuart has po pointed out. Like, we treat China as a threat to, to our interests, therefore they react to them, they trade with other nations, and they, they fund certain countries, they act as a threat. Like, like the prop is self-fulfilling. We treat them like a threat, they respond back, ergo, ipso facto, maybe the argument is not to treat them as a threat. Okay, right, intellectual property stuff. She says, oh, they're, they're copying all of our stuff. All, of the all this proves is that all of the ideas, which I'm going to talk about in my speech, are coming from the US. All of the latest ideas about the things that make our lives better, technological innovations, are coming from the US. China cannot technologically surpass the US on its own. It merely has to co counterfeit. And the thing about counterfeits is definitionally they can't get better. So in and of itself, the chi like, we are still leading China. Uh, very quickly, the environment. Like, China just experiences environmental degradation. Like, she talked about the number of people who don't breathe clean air. Like, it's, as China becomes increasingly responsive to its population, it has an incentive to, in, like, you know, clean itself up, in, you know, become more green, and ultimately, we are the ones that are going to be providing those technologies for them. Okay, on to my speech. I want to talk to you... About, no, thank you, sir. I haven't really started. Uh, firstly, I, I want to talk to you about debt. We've got campaigns by Citizens Against Government Waste telling us that China will own the US due to its debt. At present, China owns about 8% of US debt. Britain and Japan combined own about the same amount. Only approximately one quarter of US debt is owned by other nations, meaning that 10 times as many US Treasury bonds are owned by US people as are owned by China. So I'm sorry to say, guys, it, the, if owning US bonds makes you a threat, you guys are a threat to yourselves. <laughs> right. No, thank you. Right. Um, right, for a second, let's assume what UGA said is true, and the terrifying 8% of debt that China owns is a threat to America. 
right? What are they going to do with it? They're not going to sell it off, uh, sell off US bonds en masse because ultimately they want to trade with us. And it's not like Germany in 1914 because like, there was nowhere near the level of economic integration that you have. Like, countries are just interdependent where you have no completely economically self-sufficient country. It's completely disanalogous, right? China trade with the US is what got China uh, millions of people out of poverty. Selling off US bonds would damage markets and ultimately hurt China, which is a bit like trying to solve the argument with the guy who lives next door to you by burning down the whole apartment, <laughs> right? As well as this, China has strong reasons not to upset the US and the UK over trade. They are major exporters, and the threat by the, U the US in 2005 to impose a 27.5% tariff on all Chinese imports was enough to make them back down and revalue their currency. Similarly, the impounding of large amounts of Chinese-made clothing by the EU in what was dubbed bra wars had real consequences. Unfortunately, it didn't mean women in Europe wearing fewer clothes, but it did show the China that the EU was an economic force in its own right. On to my second point. I have someone I want to tell you about. Okay? Back in the time when America was founded, there was a Scottish economist called Adam Smith who, as far as I'm aware, was the last clever person to come out of Scotland. <laughs> now, now he, he, he's so important to us that we went and put him on our £20 note. Why did we do this? Well, for a start, we haven't had many good prime ministers, so we can't put them on. The real reason Adam Smith is on our £20 note is he had a really great idea which no one has thought of before. He said people are most productive when they specialise in what they are best at producing. The UK and the US specialise in providing services and high-tech products. So the story of the past 30 years is that we should specialise in them rather than things that can be done more cheaply, which we can then benefit from. Go for it. specialize in is high-tech innovation. But most economists believe that wherever manufacturing goes, that is where innovation inevitably follows. So do you think that, so the argument is that innovation is to go into China. So what is going to be our source of growth in the future? Well, for this, this is going to come later in my speech, but you've preempted preempt me on this. Like 80% of people working in high-tech industries in China aren't actually from China. The people in China who are making all the innovations are from abroad and they are working for foreign companies. So the idea that China is going to steal our innovation just isn't true, okay? No, thank you. Right, like, they, there are just analogies of where this has happened before. Back in the 1980s, everyone was worried about the, r the rise of Japan, which, like, up until the Second World War, was just a military dictatorship. Now, let me, let me, uh, let me ask you all, do any of you here feel threatened by Japan? None of you feel threatened by Japan. And the reason you are is the goods that which were made by Japan made us all better off by being cheaper and, you know, just quite useful in raising our standards of living. Manufacturing jobs moving to China is good. It means uh, cheaper goods for Western consumers, meaning we get a higher standard of living. Also, the fact that the majority of innovations today are in knowledge industries, like IT, means that cheaper manufactured goods make innovation easier, because the goods are cheaper to get hold of. Not to, like, as I've said before, all high -tech in, almost all high-tech industry in China is basically done by foreign companies who employ staff who are not from China. Now, what does this mean? It means that China just don't have the skills base to replace the UK and the U US in these areas, so they're not a threat in an economic sense. They can't beat us at what we're best at. No, thank you. Uh, out of Fortune 500 companies, only 46 are Chinese, and most of these are state-owned. Now, the problem with state-owned companies is they tend to be inefficient. Most of these companies are, are either not making profits at all or they're making losses. So the dynamic companies that they were trying to point to are our, our companies, and we're the ones who are benefiting from China's growth. OK, my final point, I want to talk to you about trade with China and how simple things like trade can plant the seeds of change in China. Deng Xiaoping, the former Chinese premier, once said, it doesn't matter if a cat is a black cat or a white cat. If it catches mice, it is a good cat. He was talking about whether socialism or capitalism was best for China. What Deng didn't tell you was this. You can't shut the door on once the horse of free trade is bolted. There are people in China lit wearing Levi's, drinking Coca-Cola, and listening to Beyonce, just like Stuart. Once you start trading with people, 
you, be, you become exposed to the ideas that they hold and what motivates them. You can't separate Levi's from the American dream, liberty, prosperity, and happiness. And encountering Western ideals through trade helps achieve that. People in China buy those things because they embody the American dream, and the basis of the American dream is freedom. So China has become the world's largest importer of cats. But they are not black cats or white cats. They are red, white, and blue cats. And they are bringing American ideas to the Chinese people, ex exposing them to aspiration, which can drive their first thirst for change. So we have no reason to fear China, a nation which is helping us grow through its trade with us, which is allowing us to innovate and engage with the ideas of capitalism that we hold dear. As other nations have traded with us and made us wealthy in the past, such as Japan, so too will China. Thank you. Before our last speakers, I'd like to remind the teams, the judges, and the audience that during the final speeches for each team, <clears throat> uh, the speeches may be interrupted after the first minute and up until the final three minutes, and the speaker will have their final three minutes uninterrupted by points of inquiry. With that, I'd like to recognize the fourth and final speaker in favor of the resolution from the University of Georgia, Mr. Bobby Rosenbleeth, for a speech not to exceed eight minutes. As I conclude the affirmative position, I'd like to echo my teammates' thanks for everybody who made this event possible, especially the Oxford team who made the trip across the pond. But now I have to tell you why we should win. <laughs> team Oxford would have you believe that economic cooperation will resolve any conflicts of interest with a rising China. But as our three speeches have shown, you can't have your tea cake and eat it too. <laughs> The key question in this debate is whether there are specific issue areas in which China is likely to exercise leverage in opposition to our collective interests. We've outlined three broad categories, peace, prosperity, and the planet. While we think you should keep in mind all of the points we've raised, I will emphasize the especially worrying threats from China, and I will tell you why they are especially threatening. First. China continues to export advanced missile technology to Pakistan and Iran in direct opposition to British and American efforts to enforce the international, international missile technology control regime. In light of tension between India and Pakistan, ballistic missile technology in South Asia is particularly destabilizing. Assistance to Iran provides a technical base for the deployment of missiles that could carry weapons of mass destruction. A chilling prospect indeed. The ongoing implications of these specific scenarios and threats outweigh the possible future benefits of cooperation. Second, in the drive for cheap oil imports, China has supported genocide in the Sudan, both economically and politically through the UN Security Council. Uh, one second. This is not to mention the domestic oppression necessary to secure the Communist Party's rule, and maintaining our commitment to human rights requires acknowledging this particular threat. Your question. Sorry, Bobby. Uh, you said that um, your previous speaker basically accepted that America had done relatively equivalent things to Iran, just more sort of not, not as regularly. Does that mean America is a threat to itself? Um, well, we can have this debate about whether America is a threat to itself another time. The key question is whether China threatens the United States. And I'd like to outline, I'd like to outline our third point, which is that the North Korea uh, threat to peace and stability in East Asia, a, threat, a, a point they have not responded to in their speeches. North Korea has shown its willingness to take military action, like sinking South Korean ships. From a regime capable of developing nuclear weapons, these provocations suggest a need for international action, yet China consistently blocks this. And finally, in one second, finally, I'd like to point out that China's economic development necessarily imposes an environmental threat through ever-increasing greenhouse gas emissions. Without a commitment to reducing climate change, we won't be able to enjoy a world of incre increased cooperation, no matter how good it is. Your point. Is it not true that the U.S. basically sold military technology to Israel, which it has been using in Gaza and the West Bank? Like, if you're talking about how human rights is the thing that the U.S. should be upholding, maybe you should start in your Look, own backyard? We, we should hold ourselves and China to a higher standard. That is the point and the values that the, both the U.S. and U.K. have stood for consistently in international relations, and one that you should assess China's threat uh, based on. 
So Team Oxford have, has failed to provide very specific evidence about these uh, scenarios as to why they are unlikely. They want you to sa simply ignore these in light of the possible future benefits of economic cooperation. But even if you believe that economically developed integrated China has some benefits, our three areas of clash are examples of the grievous transition costs to reaching such an ideal world. Don't fall into their trap of seeing only the good while willing away the bad. To win this debate, Team Oxford must convince you that China's rise will be accompanied by a total reversal in the key foreign policy areas we've outlined. Yet they cannot prove when and why China will stop supporting a genocide in Sudan. And remember our evidence from the economists. Globalization can and has preceded conflagration. This is something that we have to keep in mind. Team Oxford is trying to shift the terms of the debate away from the core question. They would have you associate us with what is often an unfortunate rhetoric bashing China in the US and the UK. But our position stems not from the latest Wall Street Journal editorial page. It's our analysis of competing interests that has played out in international relations over decades. We're reading scholarly evidence. It's not just, just self-fulfilling rhetoric coming out of uh, pundits. Prefer our academic understanding of international relations um, to their analysis of punditry. As I discussed in cross-examination, foreign policy actors must, have, must make policy decisions. In this, they need to assess threats. You should evaluate the debate through the lens of a State Department or Foreign Office official and ask what is China doing and how does it relate to our interests. Their vision of a threat is pointless because it doesn't provide any guise for future action. Now, in Joanna's next speech, she will likely paint a rosy picture, trumping, the improving, uh, trumping China's improving rhetoric and the new face of uh, and, and cultural exchange. She may even sing Kumbaya. But their idealistic theory that rising tides lift all boats is premised on free market assumptions to which China will simply not adhere. As Elizabeth discussed in her last speech, China's economic model, which we are affectionately calling the Beijing consensus, is not capitalist. It's state-run uh, that seeks to steal growth, make growth a zero-sum game, um, and, a world makes it, and leads to a world where we cannot compete, a world where standards of living do not improve because China steals the innovation that happens in the US and the UK. And even if they can produce these fake products cheaper, those fake products uh, prevent American and British entrepreneurs from reaping the profits of their innovation. And that is what the, that, that's what encourages innovation in the future. And currency manipulation has a similar effect. Don't forget our evidence that we read that says that the wand of devaluation prevents the creation of 500,000 new jobs in the US and according to George Osborne, the revival of exports in the UK. Don't, let, don't forget these two specific scenarios, intellectual property rights and currency devaluation in light of their red herrings on the debt holding debate. China will not hesitate to use foreign debt holdings as leverage over the US and the UK, no matter how much value they lose from a total collapse. They know it's a game of chicken in which the US will back down before uh, first because they have the most to lose. And since gilt bond holdings are a much less substantial part of China's portfolio, David Cameron won't stand a chance. Moreover, China's hedging of its foreign debt holdings with commodities like copper is showing that it's capable of dumping U.S. debt. He talks about some benefits of uh, China holdings of debt, but low interest rates show how China can create bubbles in the United States, which is, which is uh, bad for our interest. And remember our analysis of Russia. People said that at the end of the Cold War, this represented the end of history, the triumph of liberal capitalism. Well, Ru Russia has failed to embrace that and continues to threaten us in conflicts like Georgia. But even if you believe in the panacea of interdependence, China's threat to the environment will make all of these benefits useless, and they have yet to articulate a specific answer to that. The cost of climate change will wipe out all of our riches. Our British friends will tell you that it's just not so bad being number two. And we agree, we're not afraid of being eclipsed by China. <laughs> Just like the sun finally set on the British Empire, American primacy too will come to an end. However, the American system that replaced British predominance was committed to the same general geopolitical, economic, and humanitarian principles. While we don't agree on everything, America's rise did not threaten the UK. But with China, it's different. When they start driving, they'll have a totally different destination in mind, one that diverges from shared British and American principles. The end of American primacy won't mean the end of interest and the end of threats to those interests. Ambivalence is not an option. I'd like to conclude our speech with a quote from Barack Obama's State of the Union. Referencing China, he says, this shouldn't discourage us. It should challenge us. Rising up to the challenge, accepting this as a premise for action, either towards cooperation or not, requires affirming the resolution. Thank you.
Thank you. The chair would now like to recognize the fourth and final speaker in opposition to the resolution, Ms. Joanna Farmer from the Oxford Union for a speech not to exceed eight minutes. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Ladies and gentlemen, sorry about that. I have a lot of paper. Um, so I'm scared of si like silly little things, things like the prospect that every time Prince Philip opens his mouth, he's going to offend another nation. Things like the fish we're going to see at the aquarium tomorrow, because fish really freak me out. I'm scared of Stuart when he's not had a cigarette in a while. I'm really scared in advance of my finals in May of walking through those arches and failing. But ladies and gentlemen, what this proves is that fears are irrational. And similarly, we've shown you today that the fear of China is also irrational. We are not scared of China, we don't see it as a threat, and we don't think that you should either. So in my summary, I'm going to be addressing a couple of the main points that have been brought out in this debate today. First of all, I'm going to look at the idea of foreign policy. I'm going to look at the military issues that we've been discussing. This point I like to call, guys, we all need to lighten up. Then I'm going to look at uh, the economics of this debate and why a rich China is a good China that benefits the whole world. So first of all, let's look at the foreign policy issues. Okay, we think, as uh, Stuart outlined, there are a number of motivations uh, that, have shown, that, that explain why China is behaving in the way that it currently is. They, they've not undergone a recession to the same uh, extent that any, like any of us have, um, and they're facing leadership changes in 2012 that are fundamentally reshaping the way uh, that China is working. Um, we, also, we also think that just the behaviour of the United States, the behaviour of the United Kingdom, has a lot to explain uh, for the reasons that this situation has occurred. So let's look at one of the main issues that uh, we've heard from the affirmative about their bad relationships, uh, or about their good relationships with bad people, basically. So first of all, we had this idea of North Korea. And we've pointed out that like, there are a number of reasons that China needs to take North Korea seriously uh, for, for itself. There's a massive refugee problem. Also, North Korea currently acts as a buffer between uh, China and South Korea, a country that China is currently scared of precisely because South Korea has this incredible American influence, which is seen to be such a scary thing because of the rhetoric uh, of people standing up in the Senate and saying, look, we should be terrified of China. It's that kind of thing that motivates China to turn to countries like North Korea. And then we have this idea of Iran that's come up a lot throughout the debate. I, I hate to admit it, ladies and gentlemen, but all countries in the world need oil to function. All countries, particularly a massive developing country like China, needs oil, it needs mineral resources in order to just sustain its own economy. We think they're far more likely to turn to countries like Iran to give them damaging support that damages our own interests if we make it easy for them to turn to them. If we make it seem like they can't turn to us for similar sorts of things, they're much more likely to turn to the bad bad guys, and that's the kind of threat, and it's a threat that, ladies and gentlemen, we're all part of causing. We were told that it's an exception to the rule for us to turn to these countries. No, it isn't. We've supported these similar sorts of regimes because it's, I'll take, uh, no, I'll, yeah, we'll take you in a second. Um, it's just a fact that the oil tends to live among the not very nice people, so we have to deal with them from time to time. We have to recognise that China has an agenda too, and so if we, if we change too fast, if we put too much pressure on them, China isn't able uh, to act in a way that helps us. Yeah. Your premise is that we have not economically cooperated with China, but given that they've been offered and accepted entry into the WTO, isn't there evidence to suggest that okay, we are not economically engaged prior, prior to our Our premise is not that we've not economically engaged with them. Clearly we have, and in my second point I'm going to explain why that's a great thing for the world. Our problem is that we have men in Washington, in London, who say that China is a terrible country that we should never work with on a diplomatic stage. That's what causes the problems. That's what makes China uh, turn nasty and mean that it's a country that we can't engage with on 
things like human rights. Belligerence towards China gives them an excuse to do nasty things to Chinese citizens. We need to have, as I'm now going to look at in my second point, um, no thanks, um, in terms of the economics of the situation, it's only by allowing this developing middle class that wants political power to match its economic power that we're ever going to have any of the kind of political changes within the country that we'd really like and that would also have ramifications across uh, Asia that would benefit those other countries too. So let's look at the economics argument. Now we've heard that the situation in China is similar to the situation in Russia. We think actually this is a point that falls on our side because what happened in Russia was that they were forced to liberalise, they were forced to turn to capitalism much too quickly because of the way that the US, the UK, countries in the West were shaping what was occurring uh, in that arena. We think it's much better to engage slowly on the issue uh, with China to, in order to develop any kind of change. We've heard a lot about the Beijing consensus. We would say actually the Beijing consensus is not nearly as scary um, as the, the affirmative would like to uh, would like to portray it. And anyway, how are we ever going to expect any kind of change with these countries if we don't work with them? They mentioned currency manipulation. In 2005, the, EU, uh, the US threatened tariffs if they didn't revalue their currency. China did revalue their currency. Clearly, they're willing to change if we cooperate. Um, in terms of the loss of jobs moving to China, we think like the US as much as it hurts, need to face up to the fact that manufacturing is an industry in which they are losing their comparative advantage. The comparative advantage of countries like the US, like the UK, lies in their knowledge-based industries. It's in the rise of like Microsoft, like Apple, massive companies that symbolise what America's economy has come to be in the 21st century. And we think it's, it's, it's really useful for the development of those economies that we're able to use like cheaply made Chinese computers in this country to develop our knowledge-based, service-based industries. So we actually don't think that it's a terribly bad thing uh, that, that the jobs are, are, are moving to China. Um, in terms of uh, this idea of debt, uh, we were told that it's a threat that can be leveraged at any time. We have not been shown by the affirmative today a reason why this threat is ever going to be leveraged. It is different, as Andrew pointed out, to the situation in 1914 because the world is a hell of a lot more developed than it was in 1914. Country increasingly rely on each other in a way that means that China simply cannot pull the rug out from underneath the world's uh, economic system because it damages them as much as it damages themselves. China is not Gaddafi. They're not crazy. They don't rant on about bizarre things uh, that make no sense. They're quite rational. They don't want to destroy the world and the instant way to destroy the world would be uh, to call in uh, all this debt and like collapse the system. We think it's important that uh, the trade with these countries leads to a rising middle class. Things like involvement in the WTO has meant that there have been changes, like the introduction of bank bankruptcy laws. We clearly say, uh, see that when they engage on the world stage, the involvement means uh, that they get the kind of economic power, they get the kind of political power to match their economic power, and that's so useful for us. So, UGA, I want to say once more, thank you so much for the hospitality that you've shown us uh, over the last three days, and I'm really sorry that it couldn't be any longer. But nonetheless, we've made it to the end of the debate, and I'm sure that despite all the red that I've seen on this campus, uh, we've shown you that China is not a country you should be scared of. If we continue to treat China as a threat, it becomes a threat. And in the words of one, words of, one of your greatest presidents, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. I'd like to take a moment to thank all of the debaters for an excellent debate and to thank you for listening. At this point, the judges and I will retire uh, backstage for their deliberation. Again, in the case of a tie, I will, I will cast the deciding vote. I'd ask that you not travel far um, so that you can be around to find out uh, how things turned out. So uh, this house will be in recess for a few moments while the judges deliberate.
Before I announce tonight's decision, I just want to take a moment to thank all of you for coming and also to thank all of our debaters for really marvelous exposition and their use of humor and facts, rhetoric and argument. If you ask people, take a public opinion poll and ask them what they fear the most, Joanna talked a little bit about her phobias. Fear of public speaking ranks very high along with fear of spiders, <laughs> flying and lightning. For the folks who are able to come up to this podium, speak extemporaneously, in many cases respond to direct questions, have to deal with interruptions even when they decline them, shows remarkable ability. And to do that with such grace and ability is really a great example to anyone who's interested in public speaking. And so before I announce tonight's decision, I'd like to once again congratulate all the speakers on a job well done. Thank you. The judges reached a divided decision, albeit one that did not require my vote. Um, and their decision was that the resolution prevailed and that the University of Georgia won tonight's debate. Among the points that the judges noticed was that they believed that the uh, representatives from the Oxford Union were a bit stronger in style and the representatives from UGA were a bit stronger in substance, perhaps reflecting the respective styles of this side of the Atlantic Ocean or the pond as everyone was calling it <laughs> and that side. Also, there was a consensus among the judges that Oxford had the harder position to argue, and the judges took that into account in rendering their decision. Nevertheless, there was a belief that the way that Oxford, among most of the judges, that the way that the Oxford had framed the question about uh, uh, China being a threat perhaps gave away more than they needed to, given especially that they had the weaker position. The argument that Oxford uh, pressed that the United States uh, had a somewhat dodgy history as well was a good point to an extent, but many believe that it was stressed perhaps a bit too much. And there was also a belief that the Georgia team uh, demonstrated a good mastery of the facts, especially uh, very recent events in the news, to bolster their argument about China being a threat. The decision was a close one. The judges took a while to deliberate. And nevertheless, they came to an agreement that Georgia has won tonight's debate. For those of you who have been following the series, I believe that makes it 2-2, two, two. <laughs> Georgia UGA, so I guess it's now best out of five. <laughs> Before we adjourn tonight, it's my pleasure to welcome back to the podium Dr. Trivedi with some concluding remarks. Well, congratulations, UGA. As I pointed out earlier, lest anyone have any doubts where my loyalties lay on this evening, I am wearing a red tie and I have bulldog cufflinks on. <laughs> Um, I'm very pleased that we have a 2-2 tie, and that just means we can look forward in three years to another debate. Um, I'm not going to keep you uh, any longer than we already have been. I just wanted to say a final thank you once again to all our debaters, our distinguished panel of judges, our moderator for controlling the house, and to the audience for coming out, and to everyone who has been involved with organizing this event. It has been a tremendously wonderful team effort and I think a really, really good example of what the Oxford program can put on with three years' notice. Uh, <laughs> uh, thank you and good night.